continue. Hello, we're here with uh, Justice Johnson, Charles Johnson, and uh, we will be uh, going ahead with our interview for Washington State Supreme Court. Uh, Justice Johnson, would you like to go ahead with your two minutes? Well, good evening, and thank you for taking the time to be involved in the uh, nonpartisan statewide judicial races. Um, I serve on the state Supreme Court, where I have served um, just halfway through my 30th year, having joined the court in 1991. And as you mentioned, I don't have an, an announced or known challenger yet, but we have the type of positions that um, draw challengers. And in every one of my past re-election campaigns, I've been very privileged and honored, and it's been helpful to get strong support uh, from the not only the state, but the local and the legislative district Democratic parties, um, Pierce County Republicans, um, who know me well, and and the state Democrats, and, and real strong um, labor support. And that's real helpful when it comes to judicial races where a lot of people don't know. Um, and that's why you rely on the, these interviews and your hopeful endorsement uh, to spread the word of, that you um, talk to me, you are comfortable with my experience and my commitment to public service and uh, you're recommending me to your membership. And that's what I'm asking you to do. So. Like I say, this, this organization in this district um, in the past has been very supportive and I'm looking for that support again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we'll be moving into our pre-prepared questions. And those responses again are two minutes long and Alice will be keeping track of the time. Uh, would, Jason, would you like to ask the first one? Don't forget to unmute yourself. Yes, uh, in 1930, the White Queen Court invalidated uh, a voter approved measure to create a graduated income tax in Washington State on a narrow five to four vote. Earlier this year, the Supreme Court refused to rule on whether that precedent remained valid. Do you believe the case Clolton and Chase was correctly decided on, and would you be willing to overturn it? Boy, that's a good good question. It may call upon my guessing of what I might do in a case that I haven't even heard yet. So let me answer it this way. I, I used to teach state constitutional law. We focused on that case and the state constitutional provision that was at, in play at that time we invalidated the graduated income tax and the basis for that decision or one of the bases was there's a uniformity requirement in the state constitution that all property shall be taxed at a uniform rate and my students would would read that and suggest to me that that applied to a uh, graduated income tax that was in, a, in, in front of the court at that time and did not resolve uh, any issues surrounding a uniform um, flat rate income tax. And I think that's a fair reading of, of that case. And do I- One do minute. I stand, yeah, do I stand by that? It, it hasn't been overturned yet. I've never heard an argument that it should be overturned. It doesn't mean that it's um, etched in stone, but I-, I have come to more strongly value the principles we call stare decisis, meaning that those prior decisions are entitled to a, a, a lot of deference until the, and we are convinced that they are wrongly decided and that uh, has not come before us to date. Um, 30 seconds. But that was a legislative act and the, the question that you, uh, example you used was a challenge to a, a city or a county tax and a different different issue so i don't know if um, that's a satisfactory answer but that case is entitled to deference in my view thank you so much uh mackenzie would you like to ask the second question sure thank you uh do you support the death penalty as as it's been applied, no. Um, 
And I wrote one of the opinions in the Scherf and Gregory cases that, that um, invalidated the death penalty in this case as it was being administered. And when I say administered, the Eighth Amendment and our state constitution requires a comparability analysis, meaning that you compare and contrast the sentence in one case to a, uh, the sentence in comparable cases. And about five or 10 years ago, I came to the conclusion that I could no longer come up with the words to validate one sentence of death in comparison to others. Um, before that time, I, I had no qualms about the constitutionality of the death penalty as a penalty, but that wasn't the question um, in front of us. It's whether it was being consistently uh, and comparably um, applied across the state. And what we found was that there was a, a racial bias in, in the uh, administration of the penalty and also just a disparity in one county you might face the death penalty in the very ne uh, uh, next door county uh, you wouldn't because of a number of factors resources or, or what have you and it just uh, came to the point where it couldn't be upheld so do i favor it uh, not as it was being administered and i i wrote one of the opinions that invalidated it Great, thank you so much. Um, I have the third question for Brittany. Are you available to ask that question? Should Washington State continue to elect Supreme Court justices in contested elections, or should we use some other model? Are you concerned that having to face challenges, challengers in an election would shape the way that the court decides cases? I'm strongly committed to the election of, of judges and, and realistically speaking, we would have to amend the state constitution requiring a vote of the people to essentially take their um, right to vote away from them. Do I fear that oh, elections are going to cause me or any of my colleagues current or, or former to vote a certain way? I have not seen it. Um, and I, I think it's a healthy system for me personally because it's a it's a reminder of who I serve. Um, it's not my position. I have no in, investment in re-election. It, it's a position that belongs to the people. And I've been fortunate to, to have that support and that trust of the voters in all of my previous elections. And, and I think it's a, a, a positive thing. And it, and it and it comes to play in two two ways. In the cases we decide, everyone requires a One great minute. deal of uh, investment of time, energy, and, and thought. And being responsible to a, a group, any group, um, for how you utilize that time and how you uh, invest your time is healthy. Uh, but second, it is a, a reminder to me of the people I serve and the requirement of of the public service aspect of the position, and that is uh, defined as, as changing and having the way uh, the decisions, court decisions are decided, evolve to a more efficient and uh, quicker resolution. We're constantly improving the system. We're trying to eliminate the bias in decision making and the biases is inherent in all of us. And we've made great strides in that direction. And um, I think election of judges is responsible for that. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, Laura, would you like to ask question four? Which US Supreme Court justice, past or present, do you consider as a model for how to be an effective and just member of the highest court? Um, you know, there's so many I admire, but the one, that, Current on, on the current court, I probably look up to most is Breyer, and the reason I say that is he is a, he's got a command of the English language that I envy. He can express himself in ways that are both um, intellectual but understandable. And the challenge I, I say the greatest challenge that I have and all of my colleagues have is to put into words on paper the basis and the foundation for our reasoning 
supporting the result that we reach. And it is, it is hard to come up with the exact phraseology that is necessary to convey that persuasiveness. And uh, most of the members of the U.S. Supreme Court have that ability, but I, I just find the words that Breyer uses uh, as, as more people directed. So when you listen to him speak, you understand what he's speaking, um, what he's saying, and, and what he's explaining in a way that, uh, like say, it makes common, makes good sense, makes common sense. Great, thank you. Um, now we're going to open this up to uh, follow up questions and the responses to these are one minute apiece. Um, would anybody be interested in asking a question? Uh, if so, raise your hand or select a thumbs up. <laughs> oh, I see Jeff. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, hi, Justice Johnson. So um, the Supreme Court uh, oversees the Washington State Bar Association. And full disclosure, I'm a member of the bar. I'm an attorney. Uh, I'm just wondering what your perspective is on the current state of the bar and if um, you're where you see it going over the next few years. Who boy. <laughs> you know, I think we ask a lot of the volunteers who make up the Board of Governors as a policy and, and day-to-day uh, overseers of the operation of the bar. Um, and they've always done an admirable job um, expending countless number of hours uh, uncompensated. And these are lawyers. Uh, the staff at the bar works hard to do the tasks that are delegated by us um, to them, the discipline, the admission uh, responsibilities. And where are we going from here? You know, with this virus, uh, we are severely and significantly challenged to to do things electronically. This meeting is, is one way that we are being uh, made comfortable with the internet communication. And I think we need to, to look into more effective and efficient ways of getting people involved in their cases in the decision-making process through whatever electronic means are available. So we're looking at that now because we have to. And I think we're ready to. Great, thanks. Are there any other follow-up questions? Okay, I don't, oh, I see Jeff again. Go ahead, Jeff. Thanks, yeah, if we, if we have time, I'm happy to ask another one. <laughs> so um, the uh, Supreme Court also created and oversees the Access to Justice Board, and I'm wondering um, what your thoughts are on the work that they've done recently. The last part of your question, Jeff? Just the work that they've done recently or where you see it going, what successes or um, roadblocks you see with the Access to Justice Board. Yeah. You know, we, we created that board, and I think it was a, the right decision to to do that. Um, the reason I say that before the Access to Justice Board, we had a variety of agencies or organizations or groups that were competing um, over the same issues. And we put it all under one umbrella and that increased the efficiency of the delivery to the service providers that um, hadn't existed before. So I'm very proud of what they have done and what they have accomplished. How, what is the challenge for the future? It's more of the same. Um, you know, we've done two studies now. I chaired one, and um, Justice Wiggins co-chaired the second one, researching and studying how what the unmet need out there is, and it's it's huge. It's and it's exploding Ten exponentially. Seconds. And we've got a real challenge to get uh, attorneys to people so that they are not denied their equal rights. So we need to do more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I see here that Jason has raised his hand. Jason, would you like to go ahead? Yes, uh, and thank you for your service. Uh, uh, in um, a lot of uh, Washington State uh, attorney boards, they have uh, discriminative uh, language um, with people with disabilities uh, coming on and, and getting uh, the bar. And um, could you... Uh, Give me a, a few thoughts how we can maybe change those type of uh, 
um, policies or bylaws? Well, we just approved a bylaw request from the board, current board of governors. I don't know when that's going to, um, I don't recall the effective date. And it's reducing the uh, authorized number of governors that uh, had previously been in, in the, um, allowed in, under the bylaws. I don't know, and I don't, many of the boards um, and the task forces and the subgroups and the subcommittees that the bar establishes, we've tried to uh, embrace and to um, an announce, uh, create an attitude and a philosophy of inclusiveness so that we want a diversity of viewpoints that come into the policy decision-making process so that we are confident that we have that variety and disparity of viewpoints bringing, coming together to make a, a broader and, and more substantial basis for the policy uh, recommendation. So uh, uh, that's okay. all I can say. We've always embraced inclusiveness and, and a broad-based decision-making uh, body and I think is healthier. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have Summer Stinson who was uh, trying to raise her hand earlier. Summer, would you like to go ahead? Yes, uh, Justice Johnson, when you talked about the Supreme Court precedent from the 1930s, you talked about, um, you know, the difference between a state uh, versus a city um, taxation. And also you talked about um, the difference between graduated and also flat. I wondered if you could also address um, the concept that what the 1930s uh, Supreme Court did there was say that um, income is property because if I recall correctly, and you would obviously know better, the Constitution calls out um, flat taxes for property. And so there's kind of a legal leap, I'm also a lawyer, of saying that um, income is property. And I wondered if you could address that for a moment. That was the basis for the case. And once they made that determination, um, then the uniformity requirement kicked in. So you have to go back, and I usually carry it with me, and, and I don't. Uh, the, the Constitution has a definition of property, and, and it's, it's all inclusive. It, it, it was utilized in the case as a support for the conclusion that proper income is property, uh, because by process, the reasoning was that by process of elimination, it couldn't be anything else. Um, so that, that was a determination, that's what required the uniformity uh, of taxation. Now the two ways around that are if, if, if there are the, pri the pri primary, primary way is to amend the Constitution and that's been the political hot potato in the legislature and Ten it's seconds. never been proposed. So um, until that the uniformity provision in the, in the state taxation provision uh, remains the same. Thank you. Uh, are there any other follow-up questions? I have one if nobody else does. Okay. Um, I, what do you consider your greatest accomplishment in your legal career? You know, the, the opportunity to, to serve. Um, I've always treated each election as a another opportunity. Um, what What I want to accomplish when I leave the court is the sense of looking back. Uh, I did the, the most uh, with the opportunity I had and the time I had to do it to make the what the world a better place, if, if that's sort of a trite answer, but just to do good. And it's public service. And when you, when you involve yourself in supportive uh, and are supportive of certain changes and they come to pass and they are positive changes it's a reward that comes with it um, jurisprudentially i think the the biggest uh, point of law i can i can uh, point to is our development of our state constitutional privacy uh, decision where we have expressly held that there is a right of privacy under the state constitution and that it is independently interpreted from the federal constitution so there's a divergence but it means that privacy is uh, we, we, we as citizens of this state have uh, greater privacy rights against government intrusion than other states, and, and certainly that which exists under the federal constitution. I was involved in that discussion 
those conversations and those decisions, and I wrote a couple of them. Um, and it was not a foregone conclusion when I joined the court, but it is a resolve point. Sorry, now. Justice Johnson, your time and is I'm, up. I was on mute. I apologize. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I was waiting fault. for the bell, and I didn't. <laughs> that's hear my it. fault. <laughs> I can go on forever. Oh, that's okay. You can uh, take a minute to uh, to wrap up if you'd like. You know, it's been a rewarding experience. I still have the energy and the, the, the interest and the passion for the subject matter. I, I have an investment in the rule of law. I, I thought um, for a bit that maybe I'd done enough, but no, it's, it's still a challenge. I still have uh, enjoy good health. Um, and I'm very fortunate, uh, but I also realize that the position doesn't belong to me, it belongs to you. And I've done all I can to, to do the best I can to make it a seconds. better place, and I hope to continue on that. Uh, it's, it's helpful and healthy to our process to have experienced voices at the table to not only discuss and, and emphasize what we've done before, but what, what else went into the mixture in the decisions that we've reached. And that experience, I think, is, is a good thing to have. So you would rather have a, uh, a judge who has decided more cases than the one fresh out of the box. So I look for your support. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the video now, or the um, recording, as soon as I can figure out what the button is.